Hello everyone. I know it's been a quite long day, so I hope you're still a little bit awake and can follow me today in our session around hiring. Um, I call it Hiring Masterclass because I'm going to geek out a little bit on you here, so I hope you don't mind. So I'm not going to go through the typical kind of hiring websites. Those are the questions you need to ask kind of standard. Um, before we start, maybe just a quick um, audience check. So who is a CEO of you guys currently? Hands up. All right. Do we have any HR professionals? Woohoo. Very good, very good, okay. And then who of you would say you've hired more than 100 people in your life already? Okay, more than 70, like seven zero. Okay, more than 20? Okay, okay, quite a decent amount of time. All right, let's get started. Um, a little bit about myself in case you don't know me, that's me, it's quite some time ago, but it's, I promise it's me. I'm German, I'm born here. You probably hear from my accent, sorry about that. Uh, I live in Berlin since a little bit over six years. Um, I started my career at a company called SumUp, which is a mobile payment company out, based out of Berlin in 2012, and I joined them as their first recruiter, and then along the journey took over their HR department. I then went on to move um, to a company called Vent, which is a portfolio company of Point9 Capital, the company I currently work for. Um, Bend is a New Zealand based company that does um, point of sale and I was taking care of their EMEA regions which was London and Berlin. Then moved on to point nine. I'm with the fund since three and a half years as their head of talent and in my role I support our portfolio companies with anything around people, literally. <coughs> then fun fact, I have a weird passion for penguins which you will probably realize during the um, presentation. And I'm also really, really passionate about the why behind things. So I'm really passionate about anything around psychology and basically why people perform, do, or are motivated in certain things. All right, let's kick things off. So generally, what's hard about hiring? Um, when I talk to founders, they struggle a lot, usually. Um, hiring is very, very challenging, but let's maybe understand what is the root cause for this. So when we start a company, often we don't have any sort of brand awareness. Um, sometimes it's even worse, so we're in markets where there is a big competitor just around the corner that you know, everyone wants to work with and knows. Then we have restricted budgets, obviously, specifically in the early stages, um, so we just can't afford hiring you know, that agency that does the recruitment for us, um, and we don't have huge salaries that we can hand out to people. Um, we, it's not an easy process in general, like hiring is just hard. Um, it's time consuming, specifically if you don't have an HR person in place. Um, so it takes a lot of resources for founders, specifically if it's not done efficiently. Um, and then seriously, where is everyone? I know like a lot of companies out there that you know, have a great product, have a great team, but they struggle a lot in identifying where people are. Um, and then also, who do we want to work with anyways? I guess that's a hard part too. So if I look at all these kind of problems that we have, um, it basically narrows down to two main jobs that a recruiter, a CEO, or anyone who's taking care of hiring in a company has. Which is the first one, selling. I think it's way overlooked. So every interaction you have with a candidate, customer, whoever it is out there, is a potential hire. And you should use that opportunity. So selling is a big, big thing. The other one is gatekeeping. Obviously, you don't want to hire everyone, right? You want to make sure that the right people join your company at the right spot and at the right time. So let's talk about selling first. Generally, what's our product? And I put this in there because most founders don't know what's their product. Um, what is it that candidates are truly interested in when they join your specific company? And that's the point where I'm going to geek out on you a little bit. So, what you see here is a so-called motive spectrum. A motive spectrum is something that tells us why people do certain things. It comes from science where um, basically um, people try to understand why two companies in the same market 
perform differently and what is the difference between that. So they try to narrow it down to certain things and understand why are some employees performing way better, although it's the same market, the same access to customers, and basically everything else is the same too. What we see here is six categories, and we're specifically interested in the direct motives. And I'm, I'm sure, like, I'm not going to bore you too long on this, but I, I come to the point why I want to go into this deeper. The ones we like is the play, purpose, and potential. Play means that people love the job for the job itself. So if you look at point nine in our associates, they simply love their job. They would do it probably even if you wouldn't pay them, then they wouldn't spend so much time on it, but they still really, really love it. They love digging, you know, talking to founders, digging through decks, and actually understanding what the market has there. So play is a very, very strong motivator for someone to join your company, which means the role itself. If someone enjoys the task, they probably perform better. Plus, if you sell it well, they're more likely to join you. The second one is purpose. Purpose is a second order outcome, which means, let's say our associate, you know, likes digging through decks and talking to founders, but more so he actually learns something. So basically it's a second order outcome, meaning that out of the task a person is doing on a daily basis, they get something out of them uh, for, for the long run. And the third one is potential, which means um, they love digging into decks, so they love the play, they love learning something out there, but they actually also believe that if they go above and beyond later on, they're actually doing something good to the ecosystem. So they believe in a bigger meaning. All those three factors are not only relevant when we hire people in terms of selling and accessing, but they're also really relevant when we look at the performance of people and why some perform better and others don't. Just out of the, to make that complete, I'm going to quickly talk about emotional pressure, economic pressure, and inertia. So emotional pressure means someone is joining your company because you have a great brand awareness. So you're the Uber or whatsoever. They probably don't like the job, but you're Uber, so you, know, you kind of want to work and have that company on your CV. Those people, if they only join because of that, are most likely not to perform well in your company. The same goes for economic pressure, meaning you offer more money than the company does before. Again, looking at this isolated is a problem. Looking at this in a bigger picture might not actually be a problem. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit later. Inertia means people don't actually know where they work for you. They work for you since, whatever, six months already. They started as an intern, and there's no big, basically, need to stay, but they're just too lazy to actually move on. <clears throat> so play, purpose, potential is what we're looking for when we sell and when we basically assess people. How does this translate into our product? As a recruiter, what do we sell? So obviously the product and the service itself, again, it's important for the potential, not so much for the play, depending on what role you're working in. If you're a product owner or a product manager, that means a lot to you. The company mission and impact, very, very important, touches your potential and also your, uh, your play a lot because you want to engage in something that has a bigger meaning than actually what you're doing on a daily basis. You want to be part of something bigger. Company culture, very important. And let me just make sure that company culture in this content doesn't mean um, a, you know, table tennis and dogs in the office and yoga. Company culture means how the company operates on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not what you are, it's what you do. Um, the job itself, highly motivating. People need to join you for the, doing the job itself. So this is as close as it gets, um, which also means we need to translate that back when we actually write job ads. And there are a lot of generic job ads out there, so people are not necessarily going the extra mile and actually selling jobs well. They just copy-paste job descriptions, put it in the net, and then just kind of blindly fish for people that might think or outside the box and actually know what you want to tell them. The CEO on the team, um, not only in terms of how good they are at what they do, but also on a personal level. Um, this means like I'm looking for a community that thinks the same as I do and that I can learn from potentially. And I cannot stress out how important it is that the CEO is sellable. Um, so I've worked with CEOs in the past that um, just are not the great kind of speakers that can go out there that are, don't have you know, a huge network and so on. That doesn't matter, that's not important. 
what is important is that they have a good heart, that they try to get the best out of the company, and that they're in for a long-term learning opportunity, because no one knows everything. Yeah? Um, but as a recruiter, you're selling the CEO as well. And if your CEO is not willing to do so, or putting himself in the shape to do so, it's going to be really hard, and people sense that very early on. And the learning opportunity, quickly going back to that one, touching our purpose and potential again. Now, you might realize that there is no compensation on this. You might also realize that there are no benefits and perks on this. It's for a reason. <laughs> so, people don't join you because you have fruits in the office. They don't. They don't care. And if there's anyone that cares, please don't hire that person. Because it doesn't only mean that the people are not excited about the job itself, it also means that their motivation is in the wrong area. And so, forget that. It's not a good motivator. I know a lot of people put it in the job ads. Seriously, like I wouldn't even do it because, I mean, some companies, it's just standard that you have whatever muesli and like fruits or whatsoever in the office. It shouldn't be a motivator. You don't need to sell it. If someone joins you for this, get rid of the person. Money. Now, compensation is a little bit of a two-sided thing because money can be an activator. So, for instance, if you have a person that's highly motivated in a company looking for a new job and you offer them a higher salary, it can be an activator for actually them joining your company, but it cannot be the only thing that matters. If it's the only thing that matters, the person is not excited about the job, the person is not excited about the company and the culture, um, and you can actually assess that during the interview process, which means you just hired the wrong guy because the people will most likely not perform well in your company. But as said before, it can be an activator, but everyone is paid well. So good point, not so relevant for startups, obviously, <laughs> because we're not paying too much at the very beginning, um, but along the lines, definitely, if you have someone growing. Generally, not the number one selling point. So we've learned play, Purpose, potential is what we're looking for when we sell our company. But how do I sell it now on a day-to-day -day basis? How do I put that in action? It's great to know, but what does it actually mean? I basically categorize two things, and there's something wrong with it, but it doesn't matter. So there's a pre-funnel, and there's an on-candidate selling. So pre-funnel, I'm pretty sure we all know. This is pure marketing. There's nothing really to add. There might, some, might be some things that are a little bit overlooked, like process and speed. But there are like hidden traps as well, or hidden opportunities that most people don't know. The team, for instance. Your team is worth gold. So not only because smart people attract other smart people, but because you, knew, you need to see whenever you put a job ad out there and start hiring for a role that hasn't been there before, you don't know if you will ever need to replace the role. So your candidate acquisition costs are relatively high if you don't actually use the leads that are in there and kind of channel them back. So if you hire for a certain role, why don't you, you know, the nine out of the 10 candidates that you didn't hire, invite them back for the next company event? It's going to be nine heads more that basically going to eat some of the pizza and drink some of the Coca-Cola, but they're going to be highly engaged and they're going to love what they see because they just like the team. And then you create a community out of this. So there's a lot of stuff that is overlooked. External helpers obviously make sense, not only talking about job boards, but basically anything that's out there that you can, can get. Network and community is very important. I'm not going to tell you about that. Outreach, same thing. So there is this rumor going on about you know, people that apply to jobs are not good candidates because the good candidates are in jobs. I guess that's partly true because although you are in a job and you're a loyal person, doesn't mean that you're a bad candidate if you apply. So I don't really fully buy into this. What's made more important and overlooked is selling on the candidate. And this is where our play purpose potential comes into force. So what you're trying to do, and we're going to talk about how you do this when we talk about how we do the gatekeeping, is learning about the play, purpose, and potential of the candidate that you're currently speaking with. As a recruiter, you have a hard role. Like, this is not easy. If you're selling a normal product, it means you're selling whatever, a bottle to someone. If, if they like it, they're going to buy it. But if you're a recruiter, you're selling a bottle that can say no to. So you're selling in both directions. And most of the times, if you have someone that has been a product manager and you're looking for a product manager, 
it's not so much about selling you know, the, the role of a product manager, it's making it their role. So it's learning about their purpose, play and potential and aligning this back to what you have in your pocket, actually being able to sell. So it's a lot about basically aligning expectations and making sure that they truly see what you see. And I think it's vastly overlooked that this is very important. Um, speed, process and experience. Has any one of you ever been hired from a company having a great hiring experience? Hands up, please. I know there's a point nine team in the room, you need to raise your hand. <laughs> so no one, right, thank you guys. Um, true, yeah, that's true. Because people are not good at it. And I think it's the number one differentiator from you and other companies. If you have a great hiring experience, people will talk about this. Even though you don't end up hiring the candidate, it's a super low effort to make this doable, right? There's a lot of ATS that automate news and keeping candidates up to date. So it's really not that, that hard, but people don't do it. Um, we do have a quite, quite a few um, companies in our portfolio that are doing amazingly well uh, uh, around exactly that. One of them is a company called Screen based in, in Paris, and they basically get a whole lot of candidates just out of the fact that their hiring process is so great that they refer to other candidates and say like, look, I didn't get hired, but this company is amazing. You should apply just to see the process. So please, please, please put effort into that. And then compensation, as said before, can be an activator, shouldn't be the main motivator, but sometimes you need to stop the bus for one, per the bus for one person. There's always this question is, what do you do? You know, you have a candidate and they want more money than you actually were, <laughs> were able to, to, to give and it's not aligned with the salary band, so what do you do? Well, in that case, you're gonna look at you know, the impact that person has for your company. That might be different to what the market is paying. If you're desperate for engineers and your core product is selling to engineers or whatever it is, that hire is key. So you should be able to stop the bus for that person because it's gonna be crucial for your business. So think twice if you wanna start going into transparent salaries because the moment you have that, you cannot do it anymore. But generally, Thinking about stopping the bus, giving people a salary raise or whatever it means, um, think about it more in a way that you wanna make sure that it's defensible some, if someone asks you for it later. Um, but that goes on with candidates as well. So a lot of on the left side, not so much on the right side, but the right side is much, much more powerful because it's direct marketing, literally. What could be better that if you have a customer that goes out of the room, goes to his five other customer friends, or in our case, candidate friends, and actually tells them, this was amazing. You should try this out. It's for free because you have them anyways. You have them in the process anyway. So why not use that opportunity to actually do that? So, so much about the selling bit. There's way more we could talk about, but I think those are the essentials. Play, purpose, and potential. We keep that in mind. Now, talking about the gatekeeping. How do we know if we should hire someone? And I know that's like a very generic question, but in fact, it's a question that many people have. And having a hiring process and so on and so on is challenging because it's time consuming, as we just learned. So I have two major learnings out of this on how every company can basically implement that. Um, and it doesn't need to look the same everywhere, but the key ingredients are first, know what you're looking for. I think we're terribly bad at this usually because you cannot find what you, when you know, don't know what you're looking for. And the second one, have a robust, scalable, buyers-free process. Let's look into the first one. Out of a crowd of penguins, you need that one specific penguin. That's very hard, because they all look the same from the outside. Um, there was a great blog post from um, Jason and Lemkin around the 48 types of VP sales. Has anyone read it, by any chance? Great one, you should do. Um, he basically talks about you know, how a VP sales for a seed versus series A versus series B startup differs a lot. It's literally a total different person. And while this is true, it's also true for any other role you're going to hire. So keep in mind that when you hire someone, it's gonna be for the next 18 months. So you're looking for someone that for sure can deliver the challenges ahead in the next 18 months. If they can progress further, amazing. If they can't, keep on hiring. 
Um, also, one thing that's very important, a lot of companies hire for generic names, not only in universities, but also in companies. So I hear sometimes um, statements like, well, but you know, he didn't have any big company name on his CV. And I think that basically assumes that another big company is doing a good job at hiring, and we just learned that's not true. No one of you ever told me they have a great hiring experience. So why doing it? I, I, and even if, that's tr even if that would be true, only be that because that person worked at Uber as whatever head of marketing, you know, we just learned there are 48 types, so he might not be the right fit for your specific role. So knowing who you're looking for, very, very important. Quickly, um, the topic on universities. So there is a generally um, overrating um, on IQ, I think. If you look at you know, successful people and you look at creativity level and the level of IQ over lifetime, the ones that actually are more successful are the ones that are very creative. And IQ is not easy to assess as well. As well. So um, having said that, obviously it means that you know, if someone joins Bocconi or WHO or however you want to call them, at some point of their life, they had the opportunity to get better training, which means probably they are better at what they do. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're the smartest and the brightest. And that doesn't also mean that they're just generally amazing at what they do. So really try to make it unbiased free, don't hire for generic names, and really know what you're looking for. How are we doing this? There's something called scorecard. I don't know if you've heard of this. Um, a scorecard is a list of outcomes that you want a candidate to achieve within a given amount of time after they've been hired. For instance, 12 months or 18 months. It's clear, it's measurable, it's got deadlines, and it's really narrowed down to at least, you know, maybe four to five topics. Now, why is that important? First of all, if you think it's a big time investment, I have to tell you it's not. It might put some effort in it to actually create such thing, but you can reuse it after six months to actually check, you know, is the person delivering on the goals or not. It also means that you can show it to the candidate so they can get excited about it. But more, it means that you have a structured hiring process. Because you know what you want the person to achieve, you now can link it back to what you're actually looking for. If you know that a candidate whatever, needs to scale to a certain whatever size, it means that you need someone that has experience or someone that doesn't have experience, whatever it is. So this is basically aligning an entire team on what do we actually need and who are we actually looking for. This is unbiased, so please do this even before you go to LinkedIn and check out profiles or anything like this. Um, it should be done with your hiring team, anyone who's involved and are gonna work with that person too. And basically looking at outcomes and, and making it measurable. Uh, on the top, we see another part of that, which is a short mission statement. It's like the why, you know, what is the person doing and why do we need the person? Funny enough, it links back to purpose and potential and the entire thing is play. So is it interesting that we need to sell play, purpose and potential, but it also turns out that it's actually the thing we need to make people perform on the role? It is. So we have five minutes left, you said? Okay, right. So there's a second part to this. I'm just really quickly touching on it. It's soft skills, although I hate the word because they're not really soft. Um, make sure that it's not a letter to center. Yeah? You don't need your office manager to be the smartest person in the universe. It doesn't make sense. This person needs to be strong in other areas. You should hire for their strength and not for a lack of weaknesses. Make it crisp and clear. So. Just quickly going through some common traps, and then we're ready for Q&A. So we've learned that, um, actually I'm gonna skip that one, because we have the second part. Since we know what we're looking for, um, and are clear on that, and align on that, and can assess it during the hiring process, it's now about how do we make the process actually happen, and what does it mean? When I say robust, I mean test the right things in the right way. I heard of a company that made their engineers do presentations in front of the entire company as part of their hiring process. Why? Like, what do you even assess with that? It, it really doesn't make sense, and even though you're ranking out a super great engineer because what, he can't do presentations? Doesn't matter, really. Um, or a lot of people do brain teasers still, like, 
<laughs> really, it's really like the 80s are, are way behind. So scalable means decentralized. I have a very strong opinion on managers not being reliable for creating their teams, building their teams, because they will optimize on their personal ideas, which is not necessarily aligned to what the company needs. Bias-free, have a culture addition, not for fit, and be aware of your bias. Very, very important. Obviously, happens all the time. Just generally, we can't get rid of it. I think it's generally happened. Turns out that even though you have two candidates, one is scoring higher than the other one, but you like the second one more, you would still end up hiring the second one. Just the way it is. However, keep that in mind. Hire for culture addition, although it feels uncomfortable, is important. So how do we make it unbiased? Structured hiring process with handovers. We have our scorecard. People know what we're looking for. Because we've written it down, we can actually assess it during the hiring process. So if a certain candidate should achieve X, Y, that, we can ask him in the hiring process, how would you do that? When did you do it? How did you exactly do it? What were your learnings about it? So we're actually having a compelling process that not only tells the candidate more what their challenge will be, so we're selling play, purpose, and potential, but also we're assessing their play, purpose, and potential and their experience. Because there's one thing that we cannot buy, it's experience. If someone is more experienced than the other guy, usually better shot, Common language per role, very important. Um, we had that at point nine recently. We hired an event manager. Hi, Juana, you're there. <laughs> um, and so, and we had the challenge of there were a lot of great people out there, um, and we basically had four final candidates, um, and we couldn't quite grasp which one we liked more. Although Juana, for instance, had the you know big big amount of experience, so we narrowed it down to certain key things that we thought the person should have, and basically make them rate. So we shared a common language, created common common language around what it is that we really need for the role next to a scorecard, uh, and then together could find more data points and actually assess it. Tools, there's quite some stuff out there. Please use them. Um, most importantly, the personality one. Uh, personal values and motivation. Anything else, get rid of it. You don't need it. Yeah? Personal values, as more aligned they are with the company values, as easy it is to attract the person and to manage the person. Personality, quite important too. Motivation, quite important too. And the data points for reference checks. Anyone not doing reference checks? Please don't raise your hand. Please, guys. <laughs> please. Please, please, don't do bad. Like, I'm not a friend of backdoor reference checks because this always fires back, but please do real reference checks. It's very, very important. I've made hires not because of reference checks, although the candidates scored very high through the entire process. Yeah, it's also a legal thing, obviously, depends on the country you're in, but most likely it's you're just missing out on an opportunity. Plus the reference you do, you can also sell your company to them as well. You might end up hiring in two years from here. So, if you're interested in learning more about this, I can recommend two great sources. One is called the Who Method, which is around the scorecard and the hiring process, how to structure that and align it for every role you need inside a company. The second one is called Prime to Perform, which talks more about why certain people are performing better at the job at, than others do. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Now, if there are any questions, sure, maybe we can start off from the front. Um, so we want to stop the negotiation overhead because we have a lot of employees hired in the last month. And so we worked on a formula that sets a salary for every employee and updates it every year. There's a uh, popular article about this from, from Sipgate, for example. What do you think about it? I wouldn't, I like, I, I think, so it depends. Everything you do in HR, from hiring over culture, whatever you do, needs to be linked back to the company. So if your culture generally defers to we're taking care of people, this is what we do, it could be, could be an argument, but I wouldn't do anything that's not increasing performance. So the question is, do you think that a salary increase without actually performance increase does increase overall company performance? That's, that's a question for you. Do you think that's the case? Mm, I don't know if it's the most important question for me to ask there because I, I have more problems with someone who's, for example, extremely strong but experience and a master's degree, for example, would increase your um, salary in the formula. But maybe you have a talented 21-year-old developer 
and then he gets a, a like lesser salary because he needs to start in a low role or whatever. That's more or less the problem I have with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're generally saying that what the people bring to the company, they get already evaluated on whether you're experienced. Or, sorry, I don't. I don't. Yeah, they, they get evaluated. They have a base salary for their role. Mm -hmm. For example, junior account manager, base salary 30, uh, whatever, thousand. Mm -hmm. And then they get, for example, 2,000 more if they have a bachelor degree, 2,000 more master degree, percentage of their experience as a multiplier. And then at the end, there's a yearly salary and they get it. And there's nothing to talk about because mm -hmm. that's the salary they get. I mean, if it would be my company, I would only do it if I know those people are actually performing better. Like, I don't care about univer university degrees. Yeah. 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 So if the master degree candidate is actually performing better, like having a more bigger impact on the role managing a team and, or on the company managing a team, yes. But just you know, generally based on them having a certain university degree, I wouldn't do it. Thanks. Um, I liked your, uh, your scorecard story quite a lot. Uh, at the same time, I'm running a company with say, seven people right now. We're growing, but we're not at 100 process part yet. We find that currently everybody's role is totally different three months later. And we don't know yet what it's going to be three months from now. Because, you know, we're iterating, we're learning very fast about the market. Would you recommend a similar approach in such an early stage? Or we say, no, do that when you're over 100 people. Like, where do you draw the line? What would you do? Yeah, that's a good question, I think. So obviously, if you're in early stage, um, you need generalists more than you need specialists, right? So you need generally smart people that can take over whatever you need being happening on the ground. So no, I wouldn't recommend doing it at an early stage. However, I would want to make sure that I at least have a rough plan on what the person should be doing. And I know this changes on a quarterly basis, but what you actually want to do is, if you, once you scale a lot and you don't take care of this early on, you have basically a team that is not aligned. So you have your designers, your product, your whatever, and they both, they have a lot of fight against who, who should do what. So in the early days, bringing them back to one table and aligning them more on overall company goals would probably solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. Hi there. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is around um, the test. So you were talking about personality tests and the fact that the rest is basically uh, not really uh, useful. Uh, we got rid of, our, uh, of most tests, but we still don't really understand why personality tests are really useful. And also, uh, I read a lot of st stuff about Myers-Briggs and how it's uh, n actually useless and not representative. So uh, what's your thought about it and, and why is it really useful? Yeah, good question. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I, I wouldn't put candidates through a Myers-Briggs point, so that's like a huge one. I would probably do that more for leadership teams that have more like a collaboration issue and kind of you need to show, learn about each other, need to show vulnerability. What I'm talking about is an easygoing test. There's a tool called Sabre, so S-A-B-E-R-R, -R, which is quite nice. So it assesses your personality and your personal values. So my thinking about personality, I mean, so there's like a lot of controversial discussions out there on what science currently has in place. Um, what they currently think, and this is more based, think is more based out of, uh, you know, empiric search is that your personality is based on your DNA. So you bring certain personality types to life once you're born. That's just the ma matter of fact. So they're just generally people that are in certain ways more agreeable or more open and whatsoever. However, once you grow, there are circumstances around you that shape the way you are and how you assess problems and so on. But it's not 50-50. It turns out it's more the other way around. It's probably like 80-20. So 80, your personality takes you to go certain ways and 20 is what you learn and how you react to, to the environment and the relationship you build with it. And that's why I think it's important to assess it um, it's not so much important in terms of, like, I wouldn't, re you know, probably reject a candidate if I figure out, wow, he's an entrepreneur in residence and he's not really open. But it matters when you put teams together, because then it actually can become challenging, or if you focus on diversity, that's actually something that you want to know about, more about. But ha having said that, this is not proven. Like, personality on DNA is not proven yet. So it's a theory out there that people think is true by analyzing how many words we have in the English language and measuring them or matching them back to 
to the personality traits that are currently out there. And there are five, there's actually a sixth one, this IQ, but it's not so much a personality. Um, so that is more a theory of thinking here, but I believe in it, so I would go for a personality test. Um, values, as said before, as, as more your personal values align with what the company is in for, as easier it is to manage the person, as more the people are probably gonna join you, stay longer and perform better. Um, and motivation, also very important. Um, not so much to measure it more around, um, like I wouldn't use a tool for measuring it. I would probably more try to understand in an interview process the why. Like why, what is your play purpose potential, literally. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah. I have two questions. First is, what do you think about photos against photos in the in the uh, candidate's application? And second, uh, when we talk about bias, it's very interesting because I just received an email from one CEO stating that I should hire a female in my IT department. And I responded, uh, I, I really don't care what the sex of a person is. Uh, I, as long as the person is good and uh, it fits the team. So is this bias coming from the CEO or am I just plain stupid? Because I cannot produce IT uh, candidates that are female. That's the that's problem of the education system, right? So do, do, uh, have you experienced this and how, how do you, what is your opinion about it? Thanks. Yeah, so... Uh, I think photos, like being against photos in CVs, um, like I'm totally for it. I think it's more unbiased, and there are tools actually out there that can do it also, that would basically narrow down the CV on what really matters. I think it's really important, because otherwise, it's simply a fact of matter that otherwise you overlook people. Because we as human beings are always biased. We try to optimize for ourselves. And even though we have a good intention, and so like, no, I don't care, whoever, you're still gonna optimize on the person you hire. Like if you prefer a certain candidate, and it happens with me as well, like I'm not, you know, it's just really, really normal that you try to optimize on that. And it's like a cost-benefit analysis that you basically have run in your brain around, wow, I really like that candidate. And um, I think we could do well, although it might not be necessary the good good fit for the company. So as more unbiased it can be, as better it is. And then to your second question for the females, there's a huge tendency out there to like increase diversity and this means gender. And I think that's, um, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a nice thinking, but it doesn't narrow down to what diversity actually means. That brings us back to what does it actually mean? Yeah, and, and diversity is not only sex gen or gender or religion or whatsoever. It means knowing what your culture is as a company, what you don't have, and also potentially what you need. Um, and I have this, um, I ha actually have a slide that I cut out on this. Um, there are quite some common things Wait, where is it? There we go. So there's something called skills matrix. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's basically when you're in early days, like six, seven, eight employees, and you realize there's a lot of stuff going on later on, probably, and you're not quite sure what parts of, like, what do you need to add to your company uh, going on? So what you do is you basically list the current team you have, and then you list on top the skills that you probably would need along the journey of the next 80 months. And then you narrow down who brings what skill. It's very simple. But also, you see what skills you currently lack of. Um, so if you know, you know someone needs to be very strong in hiring and you don't have an HR person, then your conclusion is if no one in the team currently has it, either you need to hire or you need to train someone because you need it. So that's a very simple way on actually understanding what diversity means for everyone. Um, I think there's a tendency having a short pass there and say like, well, we just need females. Um, it's more like a marketing initiative than it actually means diversity. So I think it's going to the wrong direction. Um, and I would never sacrifice, you know, quality over bringing on someone female. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first question, you told that uh, you started the Zoom app in the 2014. And how many people work at there and how many people you recruit uh, within next half year? And second question, right now we are a 30 people company and within half year we wanted to hire uh, 15 people more. I don't know if uh, we will uh, recruit uh, more later, but uh, we have planned for the 15 people uh, more. And we mm, think about hire a recruiter specialist and uh, we we have doubts if this is a good idea or not. 
Yeah. So to sum up, <laughs> that's an interesting question. So I joined SumUp in 2012 as employee number 28. Um, and their thinking was they made a commitment to them. So it's a mobile payment company, right? They built um, um, card readers that you, mobile card readers that you can have as a cab driver or whatever. So it's like totally mobile. You don't have flat fees. You just pay on usage. And that was basically their, their business case. It's a highly regulated market, obviously, um, but they made the commitment to their investors that I want to be live and fully workable in 15 countries worldwide in 12 months. It was kind of a stupid commitment. <laughs> Um, so that meant a lot of work for me. Um, so after 12 months uh, from being employee number 28, we ended up being, um, uh, I think, around 130 employees globally with um, offices in Brazil, Russia, and literally any country you can imagine in, uh, in, the, in Europe. That obviously didn't work out. That wasn't a smart idea. Don't do that. Yeah? Um, we went with a country manager model doesn't work, don't do it. Um, but the, the founders basically, uh, at that point at least of time, um, it was a too big founding team. It was a, five founders that couldn't really you know, align on what needs to be done with the organization. Uh, and was, it kind of re re related back to the company having struggles in actually delivering something. There is entering markets too early when there was no product market fit. Does that answer your first question? Okay, and the second question was, you have 30 employees and you want to hire 50, like 5-0 or 1-5? 15. Okay, so, um, I mean, if we go back here, this is only the beginning, so I think you need to think a little bit more in advance. If you want to optimize on everything here, so distinguish, where are you based? Okay, even there? Like it's you know great no 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 but there are a lot of startups there so you're competing with quite some companies um, it's not as crazy as in San Francisco but it will be in the in the next years you probably want to bring on someone that takes care of this and I think to be honest 15 more doesn't seem to be a lot but when you're then you know 45 employees you probably want to bring on a head of talent instead of a recruiter because if you bring on a recruiter now he's going to start with this first a lot. It's not going to have so much time because the heavy workload on this probably doesn't have enough experience also to build this out, but this is going to deliver candidates in the long run. Not this. This is pure marketing. Someone in marketing can literally do it. Like you don't need a recruiter for this. Forget about this. So I would probably recommend hiring a head of talent. Um, at point nine, we recommend something around eight employees, eight more to hire in the next couple of months. You should bring on a recruiter or a head of talent. And with HR, it's very tricky because there are not so many good people out there because there are not so many role models out there. So it's challenging to find someone really good too. So you rather want to go for someone more senior as well so you can actually build on for the future. Yeah, It's the same with bringing on, you know, would you bring on a junior engineer to build out your entire IT infrastructure? No. It, you probably wouldn't do it. So don't do the same with someone actually building out your entire organization in the long run. Okay, so a follow-up on that question. Uh, if I really want to build a world-class HR, since that tends, typically tends to be a lower priority to engineering and everything else. So how do you see going from from just a few guys in a basement to 200, at what stages do I look for which roles? If I, if I really want to take this, make this a, a priority for, for the founder. Yeah, so it's the same answer that I give, if you would ask me for when do I hire someone for product, it's skills matrix. So you are founding team, you know stuff you're good at, you know stuff you're not good at or not interested in doing. You know you will need it in the long run, so knowing that means if you're not good at hiring because you never did it or you're just not interested in it, you need someone senior as early on as possible to actually cope with that, you know, weakness that you have in there. And I cannot stress out more, uh, enough that it's really, really important to bring on someone senior that takes care of this stuff early on because there are quite some stuff we can do when we are small. So there are quite some short-term actions, mostly on the marketing side. But on the long term, on the candidate cell, it takes you long. 
It takes you long to build a brand awareness. It takes you long to build a talent pool. If you want to do it really well, knowing it's your number one distinguisher, you need to bring on someone early on because if the business is scaling like crazy, you're too late. But, but in the 18 months kind of uh, perspective, the first 18 months, mm -hmm. that won't be you. So, so how does that person look like? It's not a recruiter? Because I can understand, yeah. when, when we're 50 guys, you, will, you yeah. would be perfect. But up to 50, yeah, but... Yeah, so I think I would hire someone like me. If you're 15 guys and you're gonna scale, and you know it's not something that you enjoy doing, nor do you have enough experience in it, I would hire someone with around five to six years of experience. Ideally someone with a recruiting background uh, and someone that has worked in startups, in technology, and eager to learn. Cool, thanks. There are a couple more questions I saw. Hi, so um, two questions. You mentioned one, this, the timeline of 18 months when you're hiring someone, you're looking into the next 18 months. So why is that? Where does it come from? And the second one, you also mentioned you want to test for personality, for personal values, no brain teasers. So what is your take on brain teasers? Why are they bad? When can they be good? Just like overall your, your uh, turn on it. Sure, so 18 months is basically related to financing rounds. Yeah, so it's usually the steps companies make. And then uh, once you have financing, you also hire a lot of people, so roles change a lot. Yeah, someone that basically ran as a one-man show now needs to lead people, it's a, it's a different role. So you might want to hire someone new for that. Um, and um, uh, they're like specifically on the VP of sales. I personally have not met a VP of sales that is good at selling processes and hiring and building teams at the same time. If you have someone, please guide them my way, because I'm going to poach them probably. <laughs> so that's simply why the 18 months is. Then the second question was on personality, on brain teasers, right? So, uh, so I don't necessarily have something against brain teasers. I just think they're very generic. So why would I like? Why would I make them, you know, an office manager, you know, um, basically solve a brain teaser? Right. Right, so, yeah, 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 so, I, so, again, this is for me, like, I don't know, I know then the, first of all, like, there are a lot of brain teasers out there, so people, people read them, hijack them, and know how to, to go around that, and I think it might be an indicator of someone being used to it, so we have a general bias in, in all um, to measure things that are easy to measure, um, but they're not necessarily what we need to measure. Yeah, and I don't know if a product manager, like a product manager for me doesn't need to solve a problem. He needs to be very customer focused. He needs to have a vision. He needs to be very analytical, like I agree to that, but I wouldn't necessarily say that a brain teaser means someone's analytical. So for a product manager, I would probably um, have a, a totally different hiring process. I would probably ask them around, how do you continuously learn? How do you engage with the environment? How do you stay up to date? How did you do that in the past? How did you build teams? Stuff like that, it is really relevant and on the job. And brain teasers are just very generic. And to be quite frank, I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't need, I wouldn't know what to do with that as an outcome. If someone half solves it, what does it mean? Like, am I gonna hire, I don't know, yeah. Hi. Uh, how do you look at uh, stock incentive plans? Stock incentive plans, how do you look at that? Do you see it as part of the compensation topic or is it something separate for you? Yeah, good question. So I think there are two, two sides of the story to, to stock. Um, it also depends heavily on where you're based in Europe because the regulations um, are, are quite different, right? So um, first of all, if you hire someone senior, you need to compensate them for the risk they're taking. So if you're an early stage startup and you're hiring that VP sales from Uber, he's probably want to take stock. And that's okay, because you're compensating him from the risk and you can't pay him the amount of salary that he would get at whatever Uber. So in that case, yes, yeah, you compensate the risk that people are taking. Handing out stock options to every employee, I don't know, because I personally think that anything that is not a month to month or a weekly transaction you hand out to someone um, is actually be valued in the same way. 
Yeah, so it's a nice thinking, but most people don't understand it. And I remember um, a couple of years ago, there was a big research like globally around how people actually perceive bonuses, um, you know, in investment banking and so on, where you get huge bonuses. And it turns out that I think 90% of all managers would rather have the money up front than actually waiting for a bonus. So it doesn't actually incentivize people. So it's a question on why. Why would you hand out equity? If you do hand it out because it's a part of company culture and you could have a reasoning for, go for it. If it's just to engage someone, it doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, or to uh, simply the fact. So, mixed feelings there. Yeah. So you talked about hiring for cultural addition. So I have two questions regarding this. So in the first step, how do you figure out so which tools, methods, matrix you're using to figure out which addition in culture is needed? And in the second step, how do you figure out if a candidate brings this addition to the team potentially? Yeah, I'm going to start with the second or the second one and uh, uh, the first question or the answer to it, it's basically the same. So what I do is I like to give them live tests and learn about them. So I really, what we do is like every single employee at Point Nine, for instance, gets a real life scenario. It's a short, th whatever, like on the job scenario that they solve and they're going to go through uh, us and answering their questions. So we want to understand their way of thinking. So this is a big, big learning for us. And it's, I know it's, it, I can't really you know, put it into a tool or numbers or anything like this. Um, further than we don't do it at point nine, but I would do it uh, at a different company is assessing personality traits and find, trying to find someone that is out of the others. So how it works, it looks like a net. Basically, you're always on a scale. You're not, you're not scoring a certain percentage, but you're always on a scale from you know, very open to not open at all, and then you, it depends on where you are. So that is something that I would do. Other than that, I don't even have a strategic approach to this. I know what the culture at the company is that I'm working for, so I know if someone brings an additional view to this, that's probably appealing to me. If someone is generally from a different cultural background, that's very appealing to me because they just have seen different things. They just you know, have a different environment, different network, different school. It's just this, they have different views on things because they grew up in a different way than other team members did. That's an ingredient, but I can't measure it. Like I can't really tell you explicitly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think this um, defining roles based on what you need for the next 18 months makes a lot of sense. I'm just wondering how it works in practice. Are you transparent about that towards the uh, candidates or do you have temporary contracts anyways or expect a high turnover or do you just reassess after the next, uh, the following funding round? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, so when I say for the next 18 months, so I mean that I'm not planning on letting the person go. <laughs> so just, just to get that right, yeah? So um, I just mean that this is the goals the person should sol solve in the next 18 months. Uh, ideally, that person grows with the company, because ideally I did a good job too, so that means we have a culture of learning and um, progressing towards that goal. Um, but it just means that those are the things that I would like the person to solve for me. So I do this to make sure that, and yes, I'm very open to this, so scorecards are shown to candidates, so they can look at it and can tell me, you know, this is, doesn't work, or I would tweak it a little bit here, so I continuously use their feedback as learning as well. Um, but we're not just hiring people for 18 months. That would be insane. <laughs> no, no. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting, uh, very nice summary. I wish I saw this when I started. <laughs> um, I have a question. Do you have experience in uh, interim uh, head of talent or like a founder from a different startup joining another startup or uh, some kind of talent pooling between founders in an ecosystem like Berlin, for example? Like someone comes to me, it's not a good fit, but I have an idea, it might be your fit. Is that okay? Is it ethical in your opinion? That, so the first question is the interim and the second one, and I have a third one, but just to divide it. <laughs> okay, so there are companies that give you an interim head of talent, or, or there, there are people out there like freelancers that would join you for interim roles. I have experience with that. We currently do it 4.9 as well. Someone is helping us uh, as a recruiter to um, basically place another role internally. Um, 
it, it always depends on the incentive. If they're paid on their general, you know, placing, that twists their, their motivation to just placing a candidate, no matter how good he is. Um, it means a lot of effort in teaching someone. I personally think that um, a founder is the best recruiter or should be the best recruiter of the company. So if you can avoid bringing on someone externally, that's fine. If you're looking for someone that just does the heavy workload, that's totally cool. Then you can hire an external recruiter that does the rejection mails, you know, do that, does all the heavy workload. But the pure interviewing and defining, I think, should be done by the founder. So for, what was the second question? Sorry. Uh, about uh, talent pooling, like uh, you have an ecosystem of, and do you think it's ethical? Because I, I like that's how I work, and it's helped me and my colleagues quite often. And mm. I, but what is your opinion about it in yeah. terms of GDPR and all that? Yeah, stuff, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you cannot do it if the candidate is not aware of it. Yeah, unless you have someone you trust really, 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 really well, but I still wouldn't do it probably. Um, so, but there are things out there like this. I actually tried it at point nine as well. Like we have a portfolio internal talent pool where, you know, our portfolio companies can refer candidates to, but then the candidate needs to sign up as well and agree that they're part of the pool. So it's not like sneaking it under the thingy. Um, there are also other, I think there's a company called Circular out there that tries to do that on a, um, uh, like on, as a business, as a real business. They want to connect ecosystems so that if you reject certain candidates, you refer them to Circular and then others can look at them and it's basically a pre-evaluated candidate already. Uh, all right, so. I, I wouldn't do it. Um, I wouldn't do it. Like, I would want to evaluate the candidate as well because I don't trust other people doing a good job in evaluating people. Uh, plus, I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe a junior engineer for them is not suitable, but maybe he is actually suitable for me. Uh, last question. Uh, what is your uh, opinion on having the recruiter do the employer branding? Should have, uh, have you seen that done well, or maybe you have a different approach to doing employer branding and recruitment, like somewhere in HR, when you don't have a lot of uh, space for hiring a lot of people, but you want the job done? Yeah, I mean, it's pure marketing. So I have seen, uh, done it, like at Vent, for instance, a company I work with had an amazing employer branding. They did a lot of initiatives around that, but it was always in cooperation with marketing. And it's important, actually, that it is a cooperation with marketing because it's your brand, so it should be a, a red dot, right? So the people you hire, our marketing running out there as well. So you want to make sure that you get the message of the brand right, of your careers page right, whatever it is. But there are quick fix solutions out there that you can use as an interim. So there's a tool called Recruity, who's an ATS system that gives you like a, you know, a basically out of the pocket careers page that you can customize very easily. That's fair enough, yeah. Because people, if you're a no-name company, people don't go to your careers page that much anyways. So you don't have too much traffic on it, so you probably need to go out there. It's more like a referral point, so I wouldn't worry about this too early. Cool. A lot of questions. <laughs> but I think we've exhausted them all. Them all. So uh, thanks once again. Thank uh, you.